tonight's Monday Night Travel, we're headed to Eastern Asia as Moon Guidebook author Jonathan DeHart takes us on a tour of enchanting Japan. Starting from the high-octane capital of Tokyo, we'll navigate the shimmering inland sea, visit the historic capital of Kyoto, admire the towering beauty of Himeji Castle, and contemplate rebuilt Hiroshima. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. Tonight, we are venturing beyond Europe to the land of the rising sun. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be your host. And now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's special guest. Jonathan DeHart is a talented travel guidebook author, principally of two moon guidebooks for Japan, and a journalist who has lived in Japan for many years. So please join me in welcoming John. Good evening, John, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. Hey, thanks so much, Ben. Good, good, ev uh, good uh, evening to you. Good morning from Tokyo. Great to join you. I was just going to say, yes, you're joining us from Tokyo. And what time is it there exactly? It is 10.04 a.m. in Tokyo on Tuesday. So it's Tuesday morning travel for you, I suppose. Tuesday morning travel, yes, exactly. <laughs> Has well, a different ring to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're just so thankful, John, that you're here with us today to talk about one of the favorite places that I've ever traveled to. Um, are you are you enjoying any Japanese delicacies this evening? I think you might have something to share. <laughs> I do. I do. I have an early lunch here ready to go. Uh, actually, first, I should say I'm drinking a, a, a very Japanese drink, a 7-Eleven iced coffee. This is this is my morning drink of choice. Uh, J Japan does not only have green tea and uh, yeah I have I have some yakitori here so I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick little yeah there you go little glimpse uh, basically it's chicken on a stick um, different forms of chicken on a stick different parts of the bird with uh, I've got something with a with tomato on it and something with leek on it and uh, usually it's either covered in like um, tare which is a, like a sweet savory sauce or salt you, you can choose but I've got a variety of yakitori here. Yeah. Looks delicious. I remember enjoying yakitori when I visited in 2019. Um, I have a few treats as well. Actually, this is from my trip. I still have it. <laughs> it's, it hasn't gone bad yet, I promise. After four years, umeshu, a plum liquor. Is that is that how you say it? Yeah, um, umeshu. That's right. Literally, really plum, literally plum uh, li liquor. Yeah. Very so, sweet. Very sweet. Yeah. Is it, is it, how strong do you think it is? I mean, how does it hit you? <laughs> a lot of sugar. I, I, a lot of like sugar. It. Yeah. 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 I agree. And I, I also have some, at least maybe Americanized sushi, nevertheless, very good. Nice. I'm sure and, in Seattle, you have some pretty good options. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually a ways outside of Seattle, but even here, she's okay. well, popular, some decent options, right. like tempura asparagus and tempura shrimp. So nice. Very nice. Well, John, I know we're going to hear a bit more about your background in a moment, so I won't ask you anything now. And Japan is a big country, so there's a lot for us to get to. Why don't you get us started and take us to your uh, home country now? Absolutely. Let's see. And, you know, I'll actually ask you a, a preliminary question as you're, as you're getting that set up. For people interested in traveling to Japan, how should they approach and, and mentally frame the country? That's a very good question. Um, I, so I think I think the two the two things that you want to really encapsulate in your first trip to Japan are, are seeing both its modern side and its ancient side. Um, I mean, it's, this is a pretty well known fact about Japan, but it really is unique. And and I think the the spectrum of you know the ancient side to how modern it is it's it's quite dramatic. So I think I think you know a good way to do that is of course to go to Tokyo and also go to Kyoto, the ancient capital. Um, those are I would say the two essential stops in Japan to really understand that about the country. Very nice, very nice, John. Um, now, how how did you first come to Japan? I'm curious to know. Uh, okay, so when I was 21 years old, I came and studied Japanese at a language school in Tokyo. And I actually stayed with the homestay family. The Saga is wonderful people and uh, had a great time. And after college, I, I came back to Japan just for a few years and did what many foreigners do when they first come here, which was teach teach English. 
a little bit in the countryside and a junior high school and also as a corporate trainer in Tokyo. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something different. So I went back to the US, uh, started getting some journalism experience, uh, ended up moving to Shanghai actually for three years and worked in Shanghai as a journalist and editor. And then after that, I really was feeling itchy. You know, my, my feet were itching to get back to Japan for a long time. So I uh, ultimately made the leap back in uh, autumn of 2012. And I've lived here ever since working as a journalist and an editor. And also the author of some uh, moon guidebooks, which I'll share in a bit. Remarkable, remarkable. And you have some photos of your early days in Japan too, as well. I do, I do, yeah. Um, okay, uh, let, let me let me uh, start start going through some of these uh, initial images here. Um, so this is just kind of giving a sense of of again the ancient modern divide in the country. Uh, this is so this is Osaka. Um, this is just taken out a temple in Kyoto. Some koi koi in a in a garden, a pond. This is a castle in uh, Kanazawa on the west coast of Japan. Uh, classic yukata, the, the colorful um, getup she's wearing is, a, is kind of a summer lightweight kimono and she's holding a uh, folding Japanese fan there. A one of my favorite temples in Kyoto and uh, Tokyo overhead. And yeah, this brings us to, to my, uh, my Tokyo backstory. So, so yes, I, uh, when I first came to Japan, this was my homestay family here down at the bottom, the uh, the Saga family. And uh, again, I arrived in 2004 in the winter. On the left here, I am uh, standing with, <laughs> the, it's called a tanuki. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a Shinto mythological creature. You'll notice it's got a rather large uh, something between its legs. I'll let you do some research on that if you want to look into that, but it's part of Shinto myth. So it's considered like a good luck thing that you see outside of uh, shops and restaurants, and it's got it's got quite a colorful backstory. And on the right, you've got me with a more modern Japanese myth that I think a lot of Westerners can relate to. Uh, yeah, I think for me, like playing Nintendo as a kid, uh, definitely was one of my first my first exposures to Japan. You know, that really made a mark on me. So, and this is with me and my parents, uh, 16 years later in in Kamakura at the Great Buddha, which is the same spot I am here up in the upper right photo. So. 16 years later with my parents. Yoko, so welcome to Japan. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, you know, when people are traveling to Japan, John, mm -hmm. is there a particular airport that's best for them to fly in and out of? How should they think about flights? Yeah, so most people fly into Tokyo. Um, there's two international airports. There's Haneda and there's Narita. Uh, Narita is bigger, but Haneda, in my opinion, is the better of the two. It's closer to downtown and it's just a nicer airport. It's been renovated fairly recently. So there's a lot of decent options there for food and stuff. But you can also fly in or out of Kansai International Airport, which is uh, just outside Osaka. Um, a lot of people will fly into one and out of the other, sort of the classic open jaw itinerary. Um, or you could, you know, fly into one, travel around the country and come back and fly out from there. Very nice, very nice. And um, what should people consider regarding transportation in the country? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say two things. Okay, well, first of all, the way to get around, I would say the main ways to get around, well, by far, by far, in a way, it would be train, you're gonna, you're gonna be taking the train all the time. Um, but there are also cases where you're going to use a ferry uh, to go off to some islands, uh, mostly in the inland sea, which we will cover in a bit. And uh, taxis are a little bit expensive, but they're convenient. They're super convenient, honestly. Like if you just want to um, avoid drama, taxi is always a good way to go. But you might end up spending, you know, $20, 30 for a, for a ride across the middle of Tokyo, for example, just to give some perspective. Um, rental cars are good, but just bear in mind, you need to have an international driver's license. So you can't just show up in Japan and drive with a U.S. license like you can in some countries. Um, and yeah, bicycles are an awesome way to get around some parts of the country. Like, for example, Kyoto is an amazing city to to cycle around. So I really recommend considering that if someone's coming to Japan and going to Kyoto. Um, yeah, here are just some images of uh, there's a taxi on the left and a very wild motorcycle in uh, Akihabara in Tokyo. That's like the sort of geek mecca, geek culture, tech culture um, hub in, in Japan. Um, you got some anime characters plastered all over that bike. And uh, one more thing quickly, Ben, sorry about the uh, transport I wanted to mention is the Japan Rail Pass. Um, 
So you can you can get either a one week, two week, or three week, I believe, are the, the, the options. And when you have that pass, you can ride on all JR trains around the country uh, unlimited during that time. So that's usually a good deal for most people. So just something to put on the radar. Yeah, absolutely, John. I had a two week pass and it was fantastic. It was a great, great value because we were on the move quite a bit and the trains are excellent, right? So I I, yeah. I also would recommend that. Um, Japan is a fairly large country. Could you talk to us a bit about its features, geography, demographics? Absolutely, yeah. So something we talked about before, we, we, we had a little uh, chat the other day and you were mentioning that you you felt that Japan is a very deep country. Uh, I would say that is the right word for it. It's it's you know it's not particularly large. Uh, it's it's a bit bigger than Germany, a little smaller than California. Um, but for for the for the size, there's so much here. There's so there's so much depth. Um, it's r- roughly the same length north to south. So it's very narrow, but link, north to south, it's uh, roughly the same length as the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. So uh, and, and since it's islands, there's a ton of coastline. 27,000 kilometers or 16,777 miles of coastline, 75% mountainous. Um, most of the most of the population centers are out near the coast. So it's like the flatter part of the country is, is basically along the coast. And uh, most of the interior is, is quite mountainous. Um, population 125 million. Uh, so pretty crowded. But I think the idea that Japan is super crowded gets a little overblown. I think it's not as crowded as people imagine. I mean, up in Hokkaido in the far north, it's extremely sparsely populated, for example. Um, it's just right in the in the centers of Tokyo and, and Osaka and places like that. You really do feel the density in, in downtown Tokyo, for example. But most of the country is not that crowded. Um, yeah, as far as religion, um, it's, it's both Shinto and Buddhist. So Japan has a sort of very non-Western view, I would say, of, of religion. It's, uh, it doesn't really see contradiction between having both Shinto and Buddhism um, you know, taking place at the same time. So a little bit of a different outlook on that. Um, and yeah, the government is a constitutional monarchy with the parliamentary system. It's worth mentioning that the, the um, imperial line in Japan is, is actually the longest um, continuous, contiguous uh, imperial line in the world. So yeah, it's very, very ancient family. And uh, yeah, as far as language, you know, the truth is, it, English is pretty limited. Um, it's getting better, though. I think in the last five to 10 years, Japan is the government's really made a push to try to promote tourism more. And you have seen there's definitely an improvement, especially in like, you know, train stations and uh, shop uh, shop staff, you know, restaurant servers, things like, you know, people like that are getting better for sure. But by and large, Japanese is pretty much ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And how should travelers manage that that limited level of English or relatively limited? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, th- there are some I, I could I could provide you a link to some things later. Actually, there, there are some good apps that do let you, for example, take a photo of a menu in a restaurant. And it'll I mean, even even Apple like iPhones are doing that now, I've noticed. But um, there are some really good translation apps, some software you can install on your phones to take a photo of the language and sort of, you know, tr- uh, translate it in real time and things like that. Um, but other than that, I would say just learning some really basic things like uh excuse me thank you please that sort of thing a lot a lot of things that people are going to be requesting for example at a restaurant a lot of japanese are at least aware of what the english word is so if you could just add one japanese word to kind of know that so they know you're requesting for example that that'll go a long way and japanese are very forgiving so you know they're not going to make you feel bad if you can't speak japanese of course very good tips thank you john Mm -hmm. now there must be a fairly wide range in climate then considering the the length of the country yeah there is um so in the far north you have hokkaido which is about the size of ireland so it's a pretty good size island um this is this is a mountain in hokkaido in the dead of winter this is a sahidake right in the middle of the island so this gives an idea of you know it's pretty intense up there in the north in winter i mean some some of the um some of the heaviest snowfalls on earth are actually in northwestern Japan. Um wind goes over Siberia, goes over the Sea of Japan, and it falls on the west side of the the country. So in winter, it's a lot harsher in uh, on the west side than the east side as far as snow goes. But moving down a bit, this is um this is the San Riku uh, Riku coastline in northeast Japan, very beautiful, like dramatic cliffs. 
Um, that's in Kanazawa. This is a uh, landscape garden also on a small island called Sato, which is on, uh, in the Sea of Japan on the west side. Okay, this is more in the middle of the country. Now we're in the Japan Alps. Um, like I said, it's 75% mountainous. And the most mountainous, the, the most condensed part of the country in terms of mountains is definitely in the central part of the main island of Honshu. Um, yeah, this is in Tateyama, which is part of the Japan Alps, the northern side. This is sort of right in the middle of the country, uh, surrounded by mountains, not in the mountains. Uh, this is part of the Shirakawa Go uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, which has, um, yeah, it's 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 fam famous for its uh, thatched roof villages. This is just a small corner of one. Got some uh, Japanese garden shots here. Here's a uh, famous bridge in a place called Iwakuni. This is a classic example of an, an arch bridge that's been expanded out across a massive river. Very impressive, tech, uh, you know, uh, architectural. I would say Japan is very impressive in terms of its uh, architecture when it comes to wood and wood, building with wood in any form. And this is a good example of that. This is a uh, an old kabuki theater in rural Shikoku. So that's what a, I think it's the oldest one on the island. So that's a pretty genuinely old theater. This is, okay, back to geography. This is in Kyushu in the far south. Far, the, the, the fourth main or the, the southernmost main island. There are four main islands in Japan. This is the southernmost main island. And uh, this is a basically a, a hot spring, but it's got so much mineral in it that it looks like this, you know, boiling cauldron of soup or something. But there's these, these are all over this town called Beppu in the east side of uh, Kyushu. So there's a lot of uh, volcanic activity all across Japan. Kyushu in particular is, is very dense with it in the far south. Um, but yeah, you, that's why you have, you know, these pools all over the country. Or all, well, yeah, all over the country, but in Kyushu specifically here. This is another example of how geothermal heat is used. This is in uh, Ibuski in the far south of Kyushu. These women are basically covered in hot sand. It's like th there's hot water underneath the beach because of the uh, ge geothermal activity in the area. So they just, you know, people go and they pay to be buried in hot sand up to the, up to the neck. And uh, this is um, uh, the Kagoshima in the far south. This, this is actually an active volcano, Sakurajima. Um, you see, it, 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 it erupts, I think, I'm trying to remember, but a few hundred times a year, at least. Like it's, it's almost a daily you know, a few times a week, this thing will, will erupt and the, the city is often like, you know, uh, clouded with ash and things like that. So, yeah, I, it's it's kind of it's kind of dangerous, honestly. Like I would say living over there is, you know, probably not the safest place in the country, but it's, you know, it's very unlikely to, to erupt in a big way. But it's just something to be aware of, you know, but people do go and they visit the volcano and, and you know, go up to it. You can hike around it, drive around it and stuff. People live actually uh, at the at the foot of the volcano. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is just a good example of how volcanic Japan is. Um, this is in Okinawa. So in the far south, you have this bow of islands that goes all the way down to almost Taiwan. Uh, and that is Okinawa. I think there's around 160 islands or so in the prefecture. And uh, this is an example of a classic Okinawan house. So you could just see the, the materials used are very different than the mainland in Japan. Uh, the wall in front of the house is actually made out of coral. So you see a lot of coral being used down there. Like the streets are often crushed coral. So it's like if you go to a, a rural village in Okinawa, sometimes it won't have like paved roads. It'll be roads like made of uh, crushed coral and things like that. And you can see at the center of the roof, there's a there's a statue uh, that is a it's called a Shisa. It's basically like a guardian deity. And you see them all over Okinawa. They are everywhere in front of banks you know, on people's you know roofs uh, in front of schools, etc. They're just very common symbol of Okinawa. And this is a beautiful beach on Miyakojima, which is in Okinawa. And this just gives you an idea of the fact that Japan does have a kind of subtropical uh, Florida. I think the capital of Okinawa, Naha's temperature, aver like average temperature annually is essentially the same as Miami, Florida. So Japan has a you know side of it that is literally as warm and subtropical as South Florida. So it goes from Hokkaido in the north which I would say is akin to maybe parts of Europe or New England, I would say climatically. And then down in the far south, you've got Okinawa. So it's quite quite a range. 
Indeed. Those are stunning photos. Thank you so much, John. Oh, uh, thank you, Ben. You know, when I went in 2019, I had a fairly classic itinerary. Uh, I went to Tokyo. I went to Nikko, kind of a little further north, briefly. Kyoto, Osaka, Yemeji Castle. It was great. But what would you recommend for a first-time traveler to Japan? Actually, you did pretty similarly to what I would recommend. <laughs> but yeah, just to go into a little more detail. Um, okay, so there's what you call the golden, it's just the, you know, the name is traditionally used. I don't personally use it, but if you Google the golden route for Japan, this will pop up. So I thought it was appropriate to use this temple. This is literally called uh, King Kakuji, which is, it's, like, it's, it's, it's gilted. It's a gilted temple on the outside. Very famous site in Kyoto. So yeah, the golden route includes uh, Tokyo, Hakone, which is a hot spring spot that you stopped at as well. Kyoto, Hiroshima, and Miyajima. So literally what you just described pretty much. Um, now, some people, that, as you see here, Tokyo, but I will say that with a quick caveat. Some people do want to fly into Osaka and start in Kyoto first, and then end in sort of modern Japan from like ancient to modern in a sense. So if you want to proceed that way, that also works very well. But I would say majority of people, probably 80, 90%, they fly into Tokyo. So Tokyo, the capital of Japan, greater area, I think is around 36 million people. I mean, it's, you know, if you look at the greater area of Tokyo, it is the largest uh, urban concentration in the world in terms of population. Um, absolutely massive. I would say like one way to wrap your head around Tokyo would be to think about it as not, not one city. I mean, it is one city, but it's almost like a cluster of cities, the way, like when you start moving around, did you, did you feel that at all, Ben, in terms of like moving between districts in Tokyo? Well, yes. And I was introduced to Tokyo as being, you know, well, I was introduced via these neighborhoods and I know mm -hmm. you're probably going to mention some of them. Um, and, and that's a great way to break down the immensity of the city. You know, it, it was very busy, but I was really impressed, and this goes for all of Japan, by its level of organization. So I wouldn't discourage people, you know, by just be based on how, how large it is. It It's manageable in many ways because of how it's broken down and because of its great infrastructure and transportation system. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it, the easiest way to wrap your head around a city this big is just to think of it in terms of each hub is like, you know, again, it's like the size of a probably an average sized U.S. city, you know, like one hub would be bigger than a Midwestern city, you know, in the, in the U.S. So, um, yeah, so the, 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 the first hub that I like to introduce people to is more in the west side of town. I'll get to that in a moment. But first, I just want to quickly mention the Imperial Palace is in Tokyo. So this is where the emperor and, uh, you know, the imperial family lives here. Um, and it's it's all clustered in an area called Maranouchi, which is uh, near Tokyo Station, kind of on the east side of what is a loop line that wraps around the city. So it's a circular train line called the Yamanote line. And you, people don't need to remember that now. But, you know, if you ever come to Japan, you'll definitely be using the Yamanote line. Um, basically, like all the hubs that we're talking about are on that line. And this is on the east side of that line. All right. So, yeah, the emperor's over there in the east. The, the eastern side of town is older in general, actually. The west side of town is a bit, a bit younger. This is uh, this is the main gate or one of the main gates to Meiji Jingu, which is a shrine in Harajuku, which we will, which is one of the hubs. It's not really a major hub, but Harajuku is a fun place for like youth culture, youth fashion, things like that. Right next to Harajuku, though, is actually Tokyo's most important shrine, Meiji Jingu. This, which this gate is, you know, the entrance to. Um, this this shrine is um, dedicated to the the Emperor Meiji who was essentially the one who modernized Japan in the 19th century. So this is this is Shibuya, uh, ground zero. This is Tokyo, ground zero in terms of just energy, people. This is the world's uh, busiest pedestrian crossing right outside Shibuya Station. Did you, did you go there, Ben? I'm, I'm guessing you probably did. I did, yes. I remember it very well. Yeah, yeah, amazing place. Yeah, it's like a pinball machine. Um, okay, so this is in Harajuku, again, back where the um, the shrine is that I was just showing you the gate to. Um, I'm not going to say that if you go to Harajuku, you're definitely going to see people, you know, wearing various, they call it cosplay, costume play 
is what cosplay is short for. So basically, like you might see some people cosplaying, especially on Sunday mornings. People tend to congregate around Harajuku Station wearing various kinds of outfits. But these are definitely like the kinds of things that if you happen to get lucky and you see someone who's really going all out for fashion, you might see some people wearing some pretty interesting things in Harajuku. So that's uh, that's that's a district that's uh, right next to Shibuya, which is where the you know hectic intersection is. This is uh, this is Shinjuku. So this is just just west of Shibuya. Um, this is on the far western side of that loop line that wraps around the city. I would say. Shinjuku is kind of like the most visually interesting neighborhood in Tokyo, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, I've, I've, I've even read that Ridley Scott um, was inspired very heavily by Shinjuku when he visited there, when he created the, you know, the, the world of Blade Runner. So you could definitely see it. You know, you see it with all the lanterns. And, you know, it's funny, like these photos were taken in the rain. Some of them were. And uh, Shinjuku is almost better in the rain at night. I think it's got it's kind of got that atmosphere. Um, this is this is the entrance to Kabukicho on the left here, this gate. Uh, Kabukicho is, I believe, Japan's largest red light district. So you can kind of guess by the sign next to that on the right. These are some signs of host clubs and hostess clubs. Um, so yeah, like in, in red light zones in Japan, it's 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 not like in, in Amsterdam, for example, where every everything goes, but there are some like sort of like PG-13 type things. And uh, host and hostess clubs would be part of that. It's basically where someone goes in, they pay to be entertained, you know, in terms of having conversation, have your drink poured, that sort of thing, by good looking women or men at a host or hostess club. So these are just uh, some signs advertising that kind of thing. It's, it's perfectly safe to walk through red light districts in Japan. But one tip I will give is do not go anywhere with a tout. If a tout comes up to you, tries to pull you in somewhere, don't don't go because there's there are some unfortunate Japan is a very safe country. I mean, literally one of the safest in the world. But there are some unfortunate scams that happen where people will be lured in by a tout. They'll have their drinks spiked and their credit cards will be maxed out and they wake up with maxed out credit card. So that kind of thing does happen. So just be aware of it. Never go anywhere with a tout. Just that's my one safety tip for this whole this whole show. This is uh, Akihabara, which is. The place where you often see, like Maid Cafe, for example, the Maid Cafe phenomenon is in, is really rooted in Akihabara. Ben, did you go to Akihabara by chance? I don't think I did. I don't think okay. so, John, actually. Okay. Well, it's basically a place where you get anything geeky, you know, video games, anime, manga, like comic books, uh, figurines from anime series, like anything like that. It, this is going to be your place. It's a fun area just to walk around, even if you're not into these things. This is just a classic local, uh, it's not, this is not actually technically a Yoko Cho, but you will see photos of Yoko Cho's in this presentation. So Yoko Cho is basically like a culinary alleyway. And uh, I, I passed a photo of one a minute ago, actually. You can see there was an alleyway with some lanterns in it and stuff. That's a Yoko Cho. So this is actually under the train tracks, literally, um, in a very local part of town. But yeah, these kinds of places where it's just a bunch of people eating on the street and smoke in the air and lanterns and noise and stuff. To me, this is one of the funnest eating, you know, dining experiences you can have in Japan. Not not the most fancy meal in Kyoto or something, but this kind of thing is one of the best ways to actually interact with locals. And this is a particularly local neighborhood in Tokyo right here. This is not a touristy area. And this is actually in my neighborhood. This is a park right next to where I live. And I included this to show that even in Tokyo, you can find places where there are no people, you know, so like th this park is popular, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's very peaceful. It's, it's a relaxed place to live. There's all kinds of quiet areas in Tokyo. So just be aware of that. And I encourage people to get out of just the sort of, you know, cluster, the, the, the cluster of hubs and, and go try to go to at least one local neighborhood outside the tourist, you know, circuit when you're the traveler's circuit when you're in Tokyo. That's just a recommendation I want to give. This is actually in the exact same park. Uh, it, this is the park next to where I live. So Hanami, which you may have heard of, I'm sure people have seen photos of cherry blossoms in Japan. Um, this is this is a, probably the most popular time of year to visit Japan. So it is very expensive and crowded, just be aware. But it is an amazing time of year to be here due to the, the the sakura which are cherry blossoms 
it, it, everybody celebrates. Uh, you see people like this in parks all across the country, throwing down tarps, throwing down newspapers, having picnics. Uh, it's, you know, rules on alcohol in Japan are more, la are, are actually more lax than in the U S so you can drink in public. There's no, there's no issue. So you see a lot of people drinking and you get, it gets a little rowdy. People get pretty tipsy and stuff. So it's a fun way to see Japanese, uh, sort of at a, you know, at their more relaxed side, I would say. And yeah, just some more, uh, photos of the flowers here. Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah. Do what people need to book far farther ahead for say accommodations during this season? Yes, absolutely. Good question, Ben. Um, I would recommend bare minimum six months, but I think honestly, even a year is is smart. I know that might sound excessive. So you, you would be able to get something if you didn't book a year out, but you're not going to necessarily have the best options. So yeah, that's my recommendation as far as that goes. What time of year were you in Japan, by the way? It was uh, early November, which was really nice. Comfortable temperatures, yeah. fair weather. I loved it. I think fall is probably not a bad time. Maybe second best, would you say, to this period? Absolutely. And and I will be showing evidence of that in a minute. So, yeah. Yeah, fall, fall is an excellent time of year. I would say spring and fall are the top two seasons for sure. And that's because the summer is so hot, right? It does get pretty hot. Yeah, I would say right now it's not that bad it's it's kind of the rainy season right now so june and early july are considered um it's kind of moved it moves around a little bit sometimes it'll start in the second half of may for example sometimes it'll end early go later etc but generally speaking june is a rainy month and it's not at its hottest but from july and august from july through i would say through september even into early october yeah i mean in tokyo and south of tokyo um it gets really hot i would say you know, 90, 95, but like quite humid. So it's pretty hot. And then uh, winter, I guess I'll just make a quick comment on this. Um, again, just to reiterate, it doesn't snow much on the eastern half of the country. Western half gets a lot of snow. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. And here we yeah, have, yeah. this is the, are these the bass here, John? Yes. Yes. So um, moving, moving on now on the golden routes, this is uh, the next stop. Hakone. So Hakone is a hot spring resort. Um, in, in Japan, a hot spring is called an onsen, O-N-S-E-N, -E onsen. And uh, they're all over the country. Uh, Hakone is just a very easy place to stop. And it's a very popular, you know, destination. So there's a lot of good hotels, a lot of really good, uh, what they're, what they're called ryokans. We'll talk about accommodations later. But um, this, this looks like a ryokan. This is a ryokan in Hakone with a nice, classic private bath in the back. And you, you'll see both private baths, which you're going to pay more for, and also, you know, public shared baths, which I would say 95% of the time are um, separated, gender separated. But honestly, there are some traditional ones that still operate as mixed. So you, it's called, so basically you, you do, I've been, I've only been to, I think, one or two, yeah, two. And it's, it's very subdued. Usually it's a lot of older people in there. Like it's not, it sounds pretty intense to go into a you know hot spring bath uh, with 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 everyone in there, but it's everybody uses a little modesty towel you know to kind of cover up and stuff. So, but anyway, in Hakone, it, I don't think there's any mixed bathing, so you're going to get either you know men's, women's, or a private bath. And there's there's other stuff to see in Hakone. This is just a uh, this the reason I put this photo in is to show that there's a lot of just steam in the landscape and like that is like underneath all of that territory down there that ground down there it's it's very it's very volcanic there's geothermal activity all over the place you can go over it you know like that in the cable car uh, there's other stuff in the area to see some open air art museums very beautiful um it's a fun place for maybe like a one night stay two night stay but yeah just a quick word on onsen etiquette um number one bathe and rinse before you enter the pool so a lot of people like you know they come to japan and they're they think they're going to get into the onsen and, and scrub down but that's really bad form so just be careful not to do that um don't put your modesty towel in the water so you do get like a little something that's literally just big enough to kind of you know drape but uh never let that get into the water it's just a it's sort of a you know just an etiquette thing don't put your head underwater uh don't be rowdy or bring booze and if you do have tattoos, it's I think it's getting a little more casual. But uh, to be honest, most onsen do not allow tattoos just to be openly shown if it's a shared bath. 
So if you do have tattoos, either if it's a small one, maybe just, you know, kind of discreetly cover it up with some medical tape or a Band-Aid or something. Or if it's a larger one, you maybe get your own private bath just to avoid, you know, crossing a line you don't mean to. Okay, so moving on from Kyoto or from Hakone, next stop is Kyoto. Um, I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with Kyoto, but just as a brief, a brief few words, ancient capital of Japan. Uh, it was the capital of Japan basically until the Edo period started. The Edo period is was basically the samurai period of Japan's history, the feudal period. So up until that point, Kyoto was was the capital. Um, and it's it's very much the best place in Japan just to see traditional Japanese culture, uh, traditional Japanese arts and crafts, things like that. It's the perfect complement to Tokyo. Tokyo, you've got Japan, you know, uh, lost in translation, Blade Runner, very modern. You've got that side of Japan totally encapsulated in Kyoto, or I mean, sorry, in Tokyo brilliantly. Kyoto is the exact, it's not the exact opposite. There's, there's a modern downtown in Kyoto as well. But uh, it's definitely the opposite in terms of what it offers uh, versus, versus Tokyo. So this is a very famous site. I'm sure many people have seen this tunnel of, of Tory gates, Vermilion Tory gates. Go, they go up, they go up the mountain. Um, it's 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 over an hour long hike, and uh, beautiful place called Fushimi Inari. Highly recommend it. In the middle of uh, Kyoto, a, a defining feature of the city is this river, the Kamo River. A wonderful place. It's not as romantic as, say, the Seine River in Paris. You know, I'm not going to say it's the same level of, of, but in a way, it actually could be considered that. It's, it is a romantic place at nighttime, especially. Uh, but a lot of people just sort of have picnics here. You can cycle along it, walk along it, and uh, it, it, it bisects the city. So, an easy way of thinking about Kyoto is while the Kamo River is slightly towards the east side of the city, if you look at that as the middle point, most of the things you're going to want to see are either like on the far eastern side of the city which east of this river because it runs north south or on the far west side of the city in, a, in an area that I'll, I'll show all these in a moment but those two you know, sort of fringe areas on the east and west are mostly where you're going to see a lot of sites there's also some stuff in the north as well a few scattered things this is it, this photo doesn't really encapsulate how busy it can get but this is a very classic little corner of Kyoto where foot traffic gets pretty insane. It's very, very, very popular, and it's hard to get away from travelers. You know, it's hard to get away from tourists in Kyoto, but it's nonetheless worth going to. This is, uh, these are some, okay, people are basically doing a little ritual here at a, at a shrine. This is a super famous shrine, which I'll have another photo of in a minute. Um, but this shrine is led to by that path that I showed in the last last slide. These are some more photos from Fushimi Inari, which is that, um, you know, the tunnel of, of the red shrine gates. Shrine gates are called Tori, by the way, uh, T-O-R-I-I. -I. And you see people like stacking up all these little miniature Tories here on the left. And you see some girls here on the right wearing yukata, just having a photo op, obviously. But yeah, it's a beautiful place for photos. Uh, one recommendation I'll give if you do go to Fushimi Inari is go try. You don't necessarily need to go to the top, but go a little beyond the, the where the where the most of the people stop. Most people walk in maybe like ten minutes and just take a bunch of photos and leave. But if you go twenty minutes, for example, you're going to get away from ninety percent of the people there. So you'll have it more to yourself up there. That's just a little recommendation for this this site in particular. Another beautiful temple in, to in Kyoto. Love this place. Uh, it's near a, a path called the Philosopher's Path. It's literally called the Philosopher's Path. Um, it was nicknamed that because there was a, a philosophy professor at Kyoto University who used to walk up and down, used to pace in this on this path in sort of a uh, suburban part of Kyoto and just like contemplate whatever problem he was working on in his work at that time. So anyway, the Philosopher's Path is a wonderful part of Northeast Kyoto that I highly recommend exploring on foot. This is another temple in that area, Gin Kakuji. Um, wonderful garden here. Here's, a, here's a, a couple little images of the garden. So you can see how they sort of rake, rake the sand. That's, that's a very classic thing you see in a lot of Japanese gardens, particularly at Buddhist temples. So that on the left there, just to be clear, that is actually you know, the sand being that's been raked. Uh, this is another very famous Kyoto Zen temple. Uh, Ryoanji up in the north, the north side of town. 
this is a classic example. To be honest with you, it's a great temple. It's definitely worth visiting. But you see a lot of other gardens that are less crowded. This is this is a moment where it's not crowded, but it can get quite crowded. You can see a lot of great gardens at less crowded temp temples in Kyoto. So this is another very famous spot in Kyoto. I'm sure a lot of people have seen um, Arashiyama Bamboo Grove. Amazing spot. Um, again, though, gets very crowded. I didn't I didn't actually include photos of the temples, but a tip for this area is if you go to the very end of the bamboo grove and you turn right, there's a site right up on a hill. There's like a driveway that leads right up there. And it's it's an amazing private. It was a place where a, an actor lived in like the mid 19th century or mid 20th century. And and uh, it just looks like an old samurai villa or something with with an amazing private garden. It's got like a moss like a mossy area where everything is covered in moss, Kyoto, classic Kyoto. You go in there, I, you might be, you might see one or two people. I mean, I've, 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 I've only seen a few people every, each time I've gone, I've never seen more than a person or two. So that's an excellent way to kind of go a little beyond, you know, this bamboo grove and see something less crowded when you're in the area. These are just a few uh, classic Kyoto images. This is the Fushimi Inari Shrine entrance uh, with all the the red gates, this is actually the the front side of the shrine, and I think that was a full moon. And I just thought that was a classic image of two women wearing yukata, just taking photos. That was in summertime, so very nice in summer. At nighttime, <laughs> daytime not so much. These are some uh, rainy, romantic Kyoto nighttime street views. You see a lot of a lot of places like this in Kyoto, and on the right, you see a geisha going into a. A shop probably to perform. It looks like she's got a a uh, shamisen, which is the three stringed instrument they play play and sing to. Uh, just a quick word on geisha: they're very expensive. Uh, they're very hard to reserve. You, you basically have to use special services for that. And uh, but but it is possible. It is possible. Um, and uh, just to clarify any misconceptions, they are not they are not prostitutes or anything like that. They they're actually. Literally, geisha means like cultured person. That's pretty much what it translates to. So they're like, you know, people of culture. These women, they they train really hard to learn all these like traditional instruments and to play all these like old traditional games and uh, just various performances. And uh, it's an old tradition. Honestly, it's kind of dying out. It's not, I'm not saying it's dying out literally, but it's unfortunately not as healthy as it used to be, but it, it does still exist. And uh, yeah, if someone's interested in that, Definitely, it's possible. Just be prepared to pay probably several hundred dollars a person, you know, those kinds of levels for, for one evening. Okay, so I have uh, one video here coming up. Uh, this is this is some advice I have on Kyoto in general. Um, I've already kind of hinted at it with some of my other comments, but because there are so many tourists in Kyoto, I highly recommend for people to go a little beyond the site, you know, when, whenever you go to a site in Kyoto, just kind of meander a little bit beyond it here and there, you know, just walk a few blocks this way, walk a few blocks that way, just see what you discover, because it's the kind of city where you can, you can be surprised, and uh, I would say like this view of the street right here, this is just a very classic residential part of Kyoto, but it's a beautiful little street, and you know, something like this is not on any kind of traveler's trail or tourist track or anything like that, um, but yeah, I have an example and a video here that I'm going to show in a moment. Um, this video is taken on the backside of one of my favorite temples in Kyoto called Nanzenji. And basically, if you walk around where all the where all the people are, are you know, taking photos and stuff, and you walk up back behind the temple, you find something special. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that video now. Okay, now we're getting closer to the destination. You might hear some falling water in a minute here. There is a waterfall up ahead. So I see an elderly couple up here who are actually uh, leaving offerings and praying, it looks like, up ahead. But I, I waited for them to, to go up to the next point, which I will kind of show. I'll, I'll point to, but I won't actually walk up to it because I want to give them a little bit of privacy. And also because I want people to be able to discover some of this on their own. But yeah, as you can see, there's a waterfall here. And up ahead,
Hakigyo is essentially standing under a waterfall and chanting. It's, it's a pilgrim, it's a practice of pilgrims. So people come here to do that. Back behind that door. And if you want to go a little further, you can continue up these steps. And they lead to like a cave. There's another point where pilgrims stop and they also lead to many points beyond. This trail connects to something larger that rings around the mountains of Kyoto. Okay, yeah, so again, that's Nanzenji, uh, N-A-N-Z-E-N-J-I. And that is in my book, by the way, Moon Japan, and also Moon Tokyo, Kyoto, and Hiroshima. Both books do have that little tip, you know, added to the uh, listing for Nanzenji. So just want to mention that. Um, again, so Ben, you mentioned you were here in, in, in autumn, moving, moving forward here. Um, so yeah, Kyoto, amazing in autumn. Autumn, autumn across Japan is amazing. You know, spring is also amazing in Kyoto. I just did not have, uh, you know, Hanami photos for Kyoto earlier. But um, yeah, for autumn leaves, Kyoto is probably the most popular spot in Japan in terms of people wanting to go there, take photos, that kind of thing. So you definitely have to plan ahead for this one. I mean, if you want to if you want to make it to Kyoto in autumn, you're going to definitely need to to book ahead. Ben, did you have any um, do you remember what happened with accommodation in Kyoto during autumn? Was there any were the leaves had they turned yet when you were here? I think they were there. Yeah. Yeah, they were there. Okay. And um, we stayed at a nice modern hostel and it wasn't a problem to find accommodation, but it, it really was gorgeous. Yeah. OK, well, that's good. Yeah, just some more shots of a uh, couple more shots of the leaves. Beautiful, beautiful time of year, especially in Kyoto. You see a lot of Japanese maple. You, know, you can recognize the shape of the leaf there. Yeah, beautiful time of year. I would say, again, you know, best times of year, probably spring and autumn in that order. But it, some people prefer autumn, you know, it just depends on, on what you're after. Winter is good for winter sports, pretty much. And summer is good for festivals, which I will cover later. Okay, so moving on from Kyoto. Um, yeah, the, the, the sort of terminal point in the golden route is usually Hiroshima and Miyajima. Um, some people will, fly, again, if you fly into Osaka, for example, you would probably go to Hiroshima and, Mi and Miyajima first and then end in, in Tokyo. So it just depends on where you start. But um, I'm sure most people recognize this, but in case you don't, this is the Gimbaku Dome, the, the atomic bomb dome. So it's a famous site in Hiroshima uh, where it, it, it was left standing after the uh, ato atomic bomb was dropped. And, um, you know, I mean, to, to put Hiroshima in perspective, it, it is it is a heavy spot to stop at, obviously, um, but it, it, it's nicely balanced by just feeling very vibrant and, you know, it, it's very contemporary, you know, like downtown Hiroshima, there's no sense of any um, connection to what, you know, happened there at the end of World War II, but um, definitely worth a stop, very important to digest the history and to, to reckon with it. But just bear in mind that there's a lot more to the city than just, you know, what happened at the end of World War II. So at the um, Peace Park, you see thousands of these colorful cranes. This is this is an example of, uh, you know, something in Hiroshima that, 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 that has an upbeat connotation, you know, and it's visually very beautiful. Um, yeah, these are cranes or paper paper cranes. You see them draped around uh, various various uh, memorials and, and, and just all over the place in the park. Um, so yeah, near Hiroshima is Miyajima. I think Ben, you mentioned you did go to Miyajima, right? Yes, briefly, okay. very briefly. Okay. So so it was just a day trip. You you went back to Hiroshima directly? Exactly. Okay. So yeah, that's what most people do. Most people will just treat it as a day trip, which it works very well for that. It's it's only about 30 minutes on the train and then like five minutes in a ferry. I mean, it's you know, less than an hour of travel, for, probably 40 minutes travel. Uh, from downtown Hiroshima to Miyajima, but yeah, very classic spot. This is this is probably the most famous, most photographed shrine gate in Japan. Um, the shrine here, Itsukushijima. This is looking back at the shrine itself. So if you were literally turn 180 degrees, you'd be looking out at the shrine gate. This is the the shrine from from the dock. Um, 
but yeah, it's a very beautiful island. As you can see, you know, behind this, there's there are like some low-lying mountains and uh also surrounding the, the island, there are nice, nice little paths. I did not get any photos of deer um put into this presentation for Miyajima, but um there are often deer kind of milling around here. They do not attack you or mob you or anything like that because people here do not tend to feed the deer. So they, they tend to be pretty tame on Miyajima. But yeah, this is the view from the mountain at the center of the island. It's just a beautiful view of the inland sea. So the, the, the whole sea around uh, basically Shikoku on the south, which is Japan's smallest main island, Honshu on the north, the west side of Honshu, which is where Hiroshima is located. And on the west, you got Kyushu, the fourth main island, the southernmost main island. That sea in the middle of all of that is the inland sea. So it's a very beautiful region. I would say if someone wanted to go to one part of Japan that was a little beyond um, the golden route and, and, you know, see something that's a bit more off the beaten path, but not, you know, really, really far off the beaten path, I would say the Inland Sea region is well worth a visit. Looks beautiful, John. Uh, you know, mm. there are so many excellent places in Japan. Now that we've covered the golden route, um, we only have so much time, but perhaps you could briefly discuss some yeah. of your favorite places to visit beyond the golden route yeah absolutely so again i would say inland sea is a great entry point but before before the inland sea i would say if you're going to kyoto uh definitely a trip to osaka um nara is interesting koyasan is interesting all these are near kyoto and himeji is a great place to see in my opinion the best castle in japan uh between kyoto and hiroshima and naoshima is an island actually in the inland sea I will very briefly show each of these places in these slides to come. Okay, so Osaka, quintessential modern jungle. I mean, I mean, I mean concrete jungle. Uh, it, it's honestly a very ugly city. It's it's not attractive visually at all. But in my, it, it's weird. Out of all the places, you can see the density of people there. You know, that's that's right in the center of the southern part of town, where a lot of people. I would say the most hectic part of, of Osaka. Uh, you see a lot of wild signs, wild, you know, like massive moving crabs with their arms are moving and huge octopus over here. There's a giant um, fugu, which is like a puffer fish uh, in, in the middle of uh, another old part of town. I don't have a photo of that right now, but it's just this giant, you know, huge. It's like having a, a blimp hanging over the street all the time or something. It's, it's just it's a very kind of just wacky visual, you know, visually wacky city. Um, you got, you got some takoyaki. So these guys are making takoyaki. I'll show some food in a bit, but it's basically fried balls of dough stuffed with octopus tentacle is pretty much what takoyaki is. And this, this photo just gives a little bit of flavor. There's, there's a little bit more of a street culture, a little bit more of a kind of grit, a grit to Osaka, I would say, than a lot of cities in Japan. Uh, this is in a sort of youth area called America, America Mura, which literally means America village. Um, this is, yeah, these are just some, some locals hanging out in a, in a place called Tenma, which I love to go to for dinner. This photo doesn't really capture the full level of energy, but on a Friday, Saturday night, this place is absolutely hopping. You can walk for probably five minutes just meandering through all these alleyways. And, there's, you know, it's just row after row of restaurant, bar, people eating in the street, smoke coming out of places. It's just a very evocative, fun, lively place. Okay, so Osaka, I would say, final point about it if you want to meet friendly japanese people go to osaka that's 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 my main recommendation for osaka friendly people open attitude much easier to get invited into things they, they want to incorporate you so very fun place to meet people um another spot near osaka near kyoto is nara so the reason i would recommend going to nara is amazing it was actually the ancient it was the capital of japan for a very brief period um way back way back in the day and um it's 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 known for this temple Todaiji, which is actually the world's largest wooden building. And for perspective, this is actually only two thirds the size of the original, which burnt down at some at one point and they rebuilt it. So it, it's it really is massive building. It's massive. Inside of it is this uh, great great Buddha, which is the largest. Uh, gr it's the largest bronze statue of the cosmic Buddha, as the English translation. So it's like there are different. Uh, iterations of Buddha in Mahayana Buddhism. I don't want to get too bogged down in detail. I'm just saying it's one of those. So it's not the largest bronze statue of Buddha period on earth, but 
of a specific Buddha. It is the largest bronze on, on earth. Massive statue. In, in Nara, it's famous for its domesticated, semi-domesticated deer. They do actually walk right up to you and you can buy little crackers to feed them. But just be forewarned if you do that, you're going to, you might be mobbed. You might be mobbed by a flock of little Bambis. So just be aware of that. Um, this is another beautiful temple in Nara, kind of overlooking the city. As you can see, there, it's sort of in a valley and it's it's a very scenic place, very beautiful. All of this stuff I should mention is in uh, Nara Park, which is a massive park, all kinds of temples. And there's a great shrine in the back that I did not include photos of, but it gets a little crowded around the main, you know, building, the, the large Todaiji and the, and the Great Buddha. But if you go out beyond that and sort of go back towards the back of the park, there are a lot of other smaller shrines and temples that are less crowded. So I recommend, again, just like with Kyoto, just wander a little bit beyond where most people are, and you'll probably see places with less people. Another amazing spot is Koyasan, which is uh, basically a mountaintop temple town with uh you can stay in, you can essentially stay in a temple. You can stay in a temple accommodation, eat the food of a monk. This is a Buddhist monk walking through Okunoin, which is um, the famous cemetery attached to this town. And in the cemetery is uh, the mausoleum of Kobo Daishi, aka, uh, sorry, I'm having, a, I'm having a, what's his name? Kukai. Uh, it's where Kukai is uh, interned. So, yeah, you can walk, this This it literally takes probably 30 minutes to walk through the cemetery. It's absolutely massive. You're walking through towering trees and it's very atmospheric. You feel like you've gone back in time. Beautiful at nighttime as well. Highly recommend going to Koyasan for one night, staying in a temple, exploring this, this cemetery. This These are just some, um, yeah, statuary and 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 some, some actual, these are actually uh, grave sites on the right side back behind that uh, shrine gate. It, it, it all gets kind of mixed in, to be honest with you, in terms of Shinto and Buddhism in, in Japan. Um, but this is a, primarily a Buddhist site. So this is, uh, this is just an example of the kind of food you eat when you stay at Koyasan. This is pure vegetarian fare. So it's one of the few times in Japan where I would say you can eat truly vegan. I mean, as, as much as you do get vegetables in Japan, it's, it's pretty meat and fish heavy. I mean, what, what, was your, what are your thoughts on that, Ben? Did you was anyone in your group traveling, you know, vegetarian or anything like that? Uh, well, there was one person in my group who was a vegetarian, but for Japan, I think um, they took a break from being vegetarian. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, it, honestly, if you're a veg, if you're a vegan, I would say you do need to do a little planning in terms of your meals and stuff, but you can definitely find food. There are some vegan restaurants, but it's not, not quite as, developed here as in the U.S., for example. Another spot absolutely worth a visit off the beaten, you know, golden route is Himeji, which has this incredible castle. I would say the best um, best example of a Japanese castle, but it's an original keep. So it's not a, it's not a, um, a lot of castles were unfortunately bombed during World War II and they were rebuilt, you know, concrete reproductions. So this is actually an original castle and it is absolutely massive. It takes probably an hour to hour, I'd say hour to properly go through it. It's, it's really big. And you know, what's better than Himeji in the previous shot? Well, he made you with, you know, cherry blossoms, of course. So you can see how beautiful it is in spring there. Something different, uh, Naoshima, another amazing spot in the area. This is the, this is what's basically nicknamed the art island. So there's, there's multiple art islands now. This was the first though, this was the original and uh, it, Essentially, it's a, a place where an investor created a bunch of really amazing art installations and museums on the island, and it's all meant to kind of complement the natural surroundings. So it's it's almost like the island itself is an art project in a way, but you're going to actual museums, and there's some amazing accommodation. Like, for example, the Benesse House is the best accommodation on the island, and you are literally staying in a museum and you literally have artwork on the walls in your room and stuff that's like original, you know, really impressive artwork. So Naoshima is a great place. Beautiful. That's that's a uh, Yayo, Yayoi Kusama. Uh, she's quite famous. She, she's, she does things for, you know, uh, like Louis Vuitton and stuff. Very, very famous Japanese artist. She does polka dot installations and polka dot art. Um, famous pumpkin sitting next to the Inland Sea. Here's the Inland Sea again. Beautiful, beautiful place. Inland Sea again. So you get these kind of views from the island along with the art, basically. Okay, so I would say those that that's that's what I would recommend for a first time in terms of 
if you want to throw in a few curveballs, I would say those locations are definitely worth it. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I would recommend for people to think about if they're seriously considering a first or maybe second trip to Japan. If you if it's your second trip, maybe you could sprinkle in some of those those places I mentioned here towards uh, the second half. Um, so yeah, I just want to make a qu a few quick comments on accommodations. Um, as you can see here, this is a capsule hotel. I mean, so these do exist. These do exist. I'm sure people have heard of these. You know, you've probably seen a documentary about it 20 years ago or something. Um, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated. I would say now, like, there are actually some pretty trendy capsule type hostels and things like that where you you go in, you know, you in your capsule, it's, it's pretty luxurious and it's all, you know, MacBook ready and stuff, you know, so... There's some really nice capsules now, but this is sort of just a traditional old school, you know, place where salary men, which is what the Japanese word is for businessmen, like they'll they'll crash there after a night out drinking with their colleagues and, you know, they miss the last train kind of thing. But it's fun knowing about this. You know, I'm not recommending people to stay in one, but some people who are real, or, you know, anthropologists with their travel, they might enjoy one night in a capsule, you know, but I'm not I'm not recommending it for most people. But some other kinds of uh, accommodations to briefly mention here, ryokan, that is the most important one. Um, that would be just a traditional Japanese inn. So you have tatami mat floors. Uh, oftentimes you'll be sleeping on a futon instead of a bed, but sometimes they will have beds. Um, and there's often an onsen, a hot spring attached to a ryokan. And another, another element of a ryokan stay is they, they usually bring a meal to your room. So if it's like a higher end ryokan, it, it, it might be like a kaiseki, which is the Japanese word for like hot cuisine, like hot cuisine, you know, like really high end stuff, sophisticated cooking techniques, very high end ingredients. That would be at the high end of the scale. S lower end of the scale could be a simple little meal like grilled fish and rice and, you know, pickled vegetables and some miso soup. So bottom line, though, is that meals tend to come with a ryokan, at least as an option. And minshuku is basically the same principle, but it's just more of like a family owned kind of B&B, &B, smaller scale, more intimate version of that essentially um, and then of course capsule hotels we talked about love hotels worth knowing about i've got i've got a few photos i'm going to show after this um love hotels definitely interesting in the sense of i mean it's i don't think it's unique to only japan but it is what people think it is it's it's basically a temporary accommodation where you go as a couple romantically and you get some private time because the reason they the reason they have such a market in japan is because japanese houses and apartments are quite small and uh, oftentimes the walls are not very, you know, there's not a lot of privacy. So that's why these things exist. Um, you see them typically like clustered around highway exits and uh, red light districts. Um, but yeah, these are these are both entry entry ways not to love hotels, but to um, ryokans. So these are some really nice Kyoto entrance ways here. These would be some very high end places. I wanted to include some photos of what the interior of rooms like this would look like, but permissions can get a little tricky sometimes with these high-end ryokans so anyway these are some more um kind of mid mid-range ryokan rooms and uh, as you can see again tatami mat floors seating on the floor you know it's a little tough for some people so honestly i will say if someone has a problem with like sitting on the floor and stuff like that maybe a ryokan's not a good choice even though it's charming you know that's my honest two cents on that but if you are up for a little adventure and you don't mind sleeping on the floor for a night or two definitely stay in a ryokan at least once. This is sort of a more modern, just, just an example of a kind of slightly more modern spin on something traditional. Also a ryokan that I stayed out in Hakone one time, a hot spring place, really just, just a cool, I thought it was a cool entryway. And there's like a shared kitchen area over there. So it's kind of like a hybrid. You see a lot of hybrid type accommodations in Japan where it's not purely one thing or the other. There might be a shared kitchen space, for example. So this is an example of that. This is a very traditional ryokan out in the middle of way up north in Tohoku, northern Honshu in the countryside. Amazing hot spring place. You can see here on the right side, that, the guy on the left is basically wearing a yukata walking to the bath. That's what he's doing. Um, and on the right side, you see the fish being cooked there. That's actually in the room, sort of in the floor. It's a floor hearth. So that would be a sort of more like traditional element you might see in like a countryside ryokan. And this is the same place. They They didn't even have... They did have electricity, but it was very minimal. And this was the kind of, you know, atmosphere at nighttime, just like very bare minimal light, very, um, very romantic, very nice, very beautiful. And this is uh, less, less romantic. This is a love hotel. <laughs> As you can see, the exterior on the right hand side there, very garish, very bright, very 
almost lurid, you know, it, it, they tend to look like this, very eye-catching. And you can see on the left, the system, in air quotes, is uh, rest. So 3,500 for, for a short visit, basically, um, 7,500 for half day, 9,980 for overnight or for the weekend. It's, it's interesting because, you know, these prices, so like 3,500, yeah, that's probably like $25 or something for perspective, 9,900, 9,980, maybe 75 bucks. So that's about what you pay for that kind of thing in case anyone's curious. And you don't interact with staff or anything. You basically check yourself in. So it's all very privacy focused. Okay. So um, some words on food and drink. Uh, ben, I'm curious, like what, what foods were your favorite in Japan? Well, melon bread, I remember in particular, matcha ice cream. And we went to a couple of sake bars. That was fantastic. Amazing food. I, I gained a little weight, I'll be honest, in that two weeks. Incredible street food as well. And I, and John, I know you have some wonderful images to share with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is inside of a yakitori shop. Again, what I've been nibbling on is yakitori. So it's literally all of those items. That's the menu back there in the back. Um, those are just different things, pretty much. Most of them are on skewers. Um, some things will be on a dish, but, you know, anything from chicken wings to uh let's see you know liver um i mean sometimes you'll see some parts of, of an animal eaten in japan that might be a bit much for a, a western you know western traveler like uh there, there's a place in tokyo that serves every part of a pig essentially including sorry to grocery out but uh, rectum you can literally eat pig rectum so i'm just telling you what's on the menu it's pretty crazy um here you go here's some stuff this is all kind of on the left that would be a very street food style um, I think that was at a festival where I took that. But yeah, shellfish being cooked on a grill, on a brassiere, just right out in the open on the street. Uh, on the right side, that's a, that's a sort of yakitori spread kind of. It's a little more elaborate than what I'm eating now, but same 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 food. Um, let's see here. Left hand side is uh, monk's cuisine, again in Koyasan at the monastery. And so that would be vegetarian. Right hand side is kaiseki which is, again, what you would have at like a very high-end uh, ryokan for dinner or something like that. And the main things I would mention about Kaiseki uh, looking at this photo are, you know, look at the visual presentation. It's very, it's very visual and there's a lot of tiny dishes and the elements, it's usually focused on like, okay, this, for this course, we're bringing out something that was boiled. For this course, we're bringing out something that was uh, you know, like a tempura item, for example, it, it'll, it'll be, it'll just be like different styles of cooking that they bring out different things for always seasonal ingredients, always very high end ingredients. So a kaiseki meal could, could cost you, I would say anywhere from a few hundred to several hundred dollars, you know, in Kyoto, for example. So it's not cheap. This is in uh, Hiroshima. Great, great dish. It's uh, the beginning of what will become okonomiyaki. Um, did you try okonomiyaki, Ben, in Osaka or something? I did. I think it was Osaka. Fantastic. Okay, okay great. Yeah. So okino okonomiyaki is literally a dish that, that came into being after World War II when people were you know, destitute and they didn't have a lot of ingredients. And they were just like, well, let's throw some things together and you know, try to make something tasty. And that's essentially what happened. I, and I, I think Osaka is where it originated, but Hiroshima has its own spin. So it's kind of like a savory pancake. But in Hiroshima, on the right-hand side there, you can see, see there's noodles in there. So Hiroshima will use noodles, whereas Osaka-style Hiroshima, I'm sorry, Okonomiyaki does not have noodles. And on the left-hand side there, that's actually yakisoba. It's just basically like wheat noodles with a bunch of uh, cabbage and meat and stuff mixed together. But you do see a lot of cooking like that over, over a griddle like that. Uh, especially in Osaka and uh, in Hiroshima. So on the left-hand side, now we're in Osaka here. Um, left-hand side, those are takoyaki balls. So they're balls of fried dough with octopus inside. Did you try that by chance, Ben? Absolutely, in Osaka, yes. Okay. W were you just kind of eating it out in the street casually, or did you go into a restaurant? It was out on the street at a little stand, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's That's the way to do it in Osaka. Just sort of eat a little bit of this, go to the next thing, eat a little bit of that. You can also sit down at a restaurant, of course, but I think like if it's your first time in Osaka, it's funner to just kind of walk around and eat it on the street. So yeah, awesome. Um, on the right-hand side, that's kushikatsu, another very Osaka invention. As you can see, it's uh, breaded and deep fried. It's just like egg. I'm looking at what's on there right now. I think it's like egg, a shrimp, maybe like some tofu or something. 
and some mushrooms maybe and looks like maybe some quail eggs there's little things on the bottom left there but yeah it's just basically it's a it's a skewer with something deep fried uh, breaded and deep fried it's it's very very tasty but very like you know it's kind of kind of like goes well with alcohol i would say it's a very casual meal but uh, that originated in the deep south of osaka which is which is a very gritty fun area to to explore um all right a little bit of seafood here on the left have you ever seen that ben did you happen to eat that by chance does that look familiar no no i don't recognize it at all okay that is um they're called sea grapes in english so umibudo it's it's actually a seaweed but it's uh, it's kind of sweet it's it's really good it's really good i've only had it in japan um on the right side of course you've got some sashimi um quick quick thought on sashimi um or sushi for that matter a lot of I've noticed a lot of Western travelers will, you know, they'll dip their uh, sushi. Sushi is when it has rice underneath it. Sashimi is just the fish. So if it's sushi, I've noticed a lot of people will dip the rice into soy sauce. That's actually not really what you're supposed to do. It's, it's considered the right way to dip only the fish into the soy sauce. And if you want to avoid, you know, dropping it in the soy sauce or dousing it in too much soy sauce or something like that, you can um, you can actually take a piece of they have like little shredded uh, ginger you know you know you know what I'm talking about Ben the little bit of there's little slices of ginger you get sometimes yes exactly I do uh, okay so some people will dip that into their soy sauce with their chopsticks and then kind of lightly drizzle the soy sauce onto the fish from the ginger it's just a little a little pro tip anyway. <laughs> Let's see. All right. On the left here, we've got uh, soba, soba noodles. Did you eat soba by chance, Ben? Yes. Delicious. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Buckwheat noodles, sometimes served cold, sometimes hot. Both are delicious and different, probably seasonally. I would eat hot in a colder month, uh, cold in a like summertime, for example. You got a little bit of tempura in the bowl on the right there. And uh, yeah, just some like toppings and stuff. And the, over on the left, it's a soup. It's got a whole bunch of uh, toppings on it. So you don't really see the, the soup underneath it, but yeah, on the right there, you've got some ramen. I'm guessing you ate ramen as well, Ben. A lot of ramen. A okay. Lot. Do you remember what types you had? Was there a certain broth that you liked better than others or anything? It was all delicious. I, I don't I don't remember exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, if I had to make one recommendation, I would say go for tonkotsu, which is pork bone-based ramen. It's very savory. It's very flavor, flavorsome. That's That's probably my go-to. Uh, on the left here, we have some soup curry, which is a Hokkaido invention up north in Japan. Really good for cold, cold, cold weather. It's essentially curry, but kind of made into more of like a soup. And they tend to put a lot of fresh vegetables in it. And you got some rice there with a little cheese on top. Sounds weird, but it actually tastes pretty good. And on the right, you've got um, lamb, basically lamb barbecue, which they call Genghis Khan. So it's called Genghis Khan in Japan because they they it's a Mongolian barbecue, essentially. So they named it Genghis Khan. Um, and then, yeah, you got, got a couple market photos here. You know, you can see like the big octopus tentacle and stuff. You can, you can get some really amazing seafood in Japan. Not surprisingly at all. It's pretty sure seafood consumption here is highest per capita in the world. I think Spain's number two, I believe. Um, here we have some matcha, you know, classic green tea with a little Japanese sweet. Two things on, you know, two things that come to my mind here are matcha is actually pretty strong caffeine wise it, it 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 was initially used by buddhist monks to drink to keep them awake during like long periods of meditation so a little bit of backstory there and uh, the sweet on the right so when it comes to sweets in japan kyoto is an amazing place to eat sweets and have green tea i would say by the way um but yeah they're not that sweet they're, they're really not that sweet they tend to be made out of like bean paste and I mean, there'll be a little bit of sugar, but it's definitely nothing on par with what you get, you know, in the United States or Europe or something in terms of the sweetness factor. Uh, ben, did you try anything like that? I'm just curious, like any dessert or anything? I don't recall any specifically. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Anyway, if, if you do get dessert in Japan, don't expect it to be, you know, insanely sweet, like you might be used to. That's, that's pretty much what I want to say. Uh, these are some more desserts. As you can see, they put real fruit inside these. So this is another example of a kind of Japanese style dessert where it's not really, you know, the ingredients are pretty natural. Like they're not really adding a whole lot of, you know, glaze or extra sugar or anything. It's just basically fruit with some rice cake around it. And sometimes these are delicious. You know, they could be delicious. It just depends on the quality of the fruit, basically. These are barrels of sake. So this is actually next to the entrance to Meiji Jingu, which is the 
shrine dedicated to the, the Meiji emperor in Tokyo that I showed at the beginning. Um, so corporations will actually donate these sake barrels to the shrine. It's considered, you know, kind of like an offering. And um, so in Japan, there's not really any issue with, you know, alcohol and religion mixing. Like it's actually quite common to see offerings of small, like um, cartons of uh, Nihonshu, which is what basically rice wine, what most people think of as a, a sake. You'll see those like left as small offerings at shrines and things like that. So yeah, there's there, you, you'll you'll see a lot of alcohol actually at shrines in Japan. It's it's an interesting facet to the culture. And there are also there's actually a quite a well known um, Buddhist temple in Kyoto that has a bar attached, and you know the no, no issue at all. So it's just a, it's a different attitude in, in, regarding this. Um, but yeah, I don't actually have a bunch of photos to talk you know to show right now about alcohol. But I will quickly say one thing that I think people um, have a misconception about is that the word sake equals rice wine. Actually, sake just means alcohol. So anything under, you know, sake is the, the, um, the umbrella that you could have rice wine underneath, you could have beer underneath it, you could have wine underneath it, it's all sake. So Nihonshu is rice wine, which is what most people think of as sake. So just want to clear that up. Um, a few other beverages to know about in Japan in terms of, of alcohol would be um, Whiskey has become big business in Japan. Uh, ironically, you know, Bill, Bill Murray and Lost in Translation was promoting Suntory whiskey. Sh sure enough, in the last 10 years, Suntory has become one of the best, if not the best, you know, depending on who you talk to, uh, manufacturers of whiskey in the world. Like they, they you, J Japanese whiskey makers have been beating, um, you know, Scottish and uh, Irish whiskey makers in the world, you know, basically the World Whiskey Awards for the last 10 years. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something to be aware of if you happen to like whiskey. Um, and uh, yeah, beer, I mean, there's, I would say what Japanese drink more than anything, just like Americans is beer. Um, there's a lot of beer drinkers in Japan. Um, you know, the big brands are Sapporo, Asahi, Ebisu. Um, I would say Sapporo probably, probably is the most desired on tap is, is the one. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, the, you know, there's different opinions out there. So, but yeah, those are the main brands. Anyway, um, yeah, so these are some thoughts on food and drink. Feel free to ask any questions later. Um, yeah, John, so, yeah. Uh, let's, I was actually going to ask you here for spirits. Do you have any temple and shrine etiquette that you feel is worth sharing? And then after that, why don't we get to some Q&A? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so when you go to a shrine or a temple in Japan... Honestly, it's not that it's not that people are not that sensitive. Um, I, I think as long as you use common sense, you're going to be totally fine. But a brief thing, if, if you do want to say a little prayer, I mean, OK, so, yeah, in terms of using common sense, I just mean, you know, wear something modest. Don't make a lot of noise. Just things like that. Very simple stuff. If you're entering a shrine and you want to kind of go one step above what maybe some travelers would do when you approach the shrine, walk along the 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 left side when you're walking in. Um, but don't walk down the center because in the center, the, 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 the idea is that the gods actually use the center as sort of the pathway to move along. So people sort of walk along the sides. And then when you exit, come down the, um, again, down the left, what is then your left side. Um, but yeah, when it comes to like saying a prayer at a shrine, um, you see, you see in this photo here, that rope hanging down. So basically what you do is you, you walk up, you, you, you ring the bell. It's actually a bell. So you pull the rope a few times, ring the bell, and then traditionally you, you're supposed to bow twice, like put your hands at your sides, bow twice, and then clap twice, and then basically say your prayer. And then when you're done, bow one more time and then turn around and walk out. And the, the box behind the rope there, that's like a donation box. Just, you know, throw in 10 yen, throw in five yen. Five yen is a very common one. So just throw in a coin, ring the bell, two bows, two claps, pray, one more bow and you're out. Like, I would say if you could, if you could handle that, you're doing more than 90% of foreign travelers. Um, and what, one more quick, quick thing to be aware of is when you hear temple and you hear shrine, they're, they're not interchangeable. So shrine is basically a, Shin, a Shinto religious building as a shrine, whereas a Buddhist religious building would be a temple. So just want to be clear on that. So when you hear people say Kyoto has 1400 temples and shrines, that's including Shinto and Buddhist sites. All right. Well, John, yeah. um, 
Yeah, why don't you share this with us? And then I, I have so many questions for you. I'd like to go. Okay, some okay yeah. I'm answer. just gonna I'll very quickly move through some images here. This is this is a uh this this is for purifying yourself. Uh don't worry about the details of how to do that are in my book, actually. So um, that's another little thing you can do when you enter. These are just some guardian, guardian, uh, guardians that you, you see the fox on the left, very common, and sort of like a Chinese lion dog guardian statue on the right. These are people write prayers on them and hang these. They're called Emma. You see them at shrines a lot. And these are actually shrines that people are giving back. So you can, you, I'm sorry, uh, fortunes. So you can buy fortunes at a shrine. And when you read it, if you don't like what you get, you can tie it to this tree, you know, a tree like this. And basically the, uh, the fortune does not apply to you. That's what those are. And yeah, sometimes people will like wave smoke around their heads. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be good for you in, in many ways. Buddhist monk. This is a Shinto pilgrim out in the mountains and just some statuary at a temple. More, more temple. Okay, yeah, that's that's all I've got on uh, on on the life of the spirit. Well, thank you so much, John. You know, all of these images and hearing the depth of your knowledge is inspiring me to go back. And you know, I, I have to say, you reminded me that I came into my trip in 2019 to Japan with uh -huh. a lot of questions about the country, and I got many of them answered. But I feel like I left with more questions. I don't think any other place I've been to has left me with a sense of wonder. Um, quite like Japan has. So thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm ready to go back as I think many of our viewers here tonight are as well. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Absolutely. So I have a very different but fun word from our sponsor tonight. We are in the running in Condé Nast Reader Choice Award for the section Best Tour Operator. And we would love and appreciate your vote. So please vote for Rick Steves Europe. You'll see a link for this in the chat, and it will also be in the follow-up email you'll receive tomorrow evening. And if you haven't actually been on one of our great tours, consider signing up for one. There's a link to our tour itineraries in the chat and in the email tomorrow as well. Okay, John, I would like to get to some questions for you now. Lisa has been kind enough to compile them for me. There were so many great ones. Um, can you use Uber or Lyft in Japan? Oh, good question. You, you can. Yeah. I, you know, to be honest, I don't use either one, but I had a client recently. So I, I'm helping people um, design trips to Japan. And I had one recently who was heavily using Uber. And uh, he said he was, it was a godsend. So <laughs> it, it is good in the sense that you can, you know, put in your, your destination and you don't have to explain things to the driver and stuff. That's fantastic because if you already have the app, you know, you're yeah. well on your way. Um, when is baseball season and, and how easy is it to get tickets? Is that something people should consider doing in Japan? That, that's a very good one. Yeah. Um, baseball season is ongoing right now. So I think it's roughly about like the U.S. schedule. To be honest, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of Japanese baseball or anything. I have been to some games, but I think it's pretty much the same schedule as the U.S. And to get tickets, there is a good site. Uh, ben, is there any way I can send you a link later or something like I can yes. I can recommend something? We can include it in tomorrow's email. Okay, perfect. I will I will include that then. Okay, great. Thanks. Matt is curious if there's anything in the news about climate change and its impact on Japanese food supply. Huh, that's a good question. Um you know, I, to be honest, I don't really hear as much about it in the Japanese media. I think I think maybe Japan's bigger food supply issue would be just overfishing. <laughs> so it's not it's not really a climate change related thing, but Japan is is known to kind of overdo it at times with like 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 tuna and things like that. So that that might be a topic to look into if you're curious about that sort of thing as far as food supply and stuff like that. That that might be a, something to look into. Um yeah, just overfishing is an issue. Now, you know, John, I really love history and Japan has a fascinating history. Uh, I understand that it was isolationist, or fairly isolationist, for hundreds mm -hmm. of years until about the 1850s, I believe. And so I'm curious if you feel that this history, this isolationism, um, is reflected in Japan and the, the experience that travelers have today. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say in the sense that Japan is so homogenous and Japanese is used, I mean, 
you can you can find more people speaking English now than in the past, but it still is very challenging in terms of language. So just that fact alone is essentially due to the, you know Japan's history as being kind of cut off a little bit from the rest of the world. Um, and I, I would say people are super welcoming here, like amazing hospitality in Japan. But since COVID has hit, I would say in some ways it almost might feel a little bit back to that a little bit. I don't know. It's it's a subtle thing I've I've talked about with some friends who live here. Uh, and they've also kind of noticed it, but you do sort of feel a little bit of a sense of that. I, but but not to the point of like feeling uh, unwelcomed or anything like that. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, I have just one more question for you, and it com comes from Cynthia. She is wondering if your behavior has changed at all since you moved to Japan, and have you found yourself adopting any Japanese qualities? That's a good question. Um, yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is shoes, shoes in the house. Like, <laughs> I feel genuinely not right keeping my shoes on, even if I'm in the US and I'm visiting family and friends, for example. Like I just I always take my shoes off at the entrance now. It's just one of those things where I kind of realized it does make a lot of sense. You know, wearing your shoes in your house, you're basically bringing everything in that you've been, you know, picking up walking around in public all day. So it's a good practice, you know, I would say that's like the main thing. Uh, and I would say also living in Japan, really, it gives you a better sense of there's a Japanese expression, read the air, and kuki o yomu, it literally means like you can just kind of sense what the situation is like in a social situation and know how to behave accordingly. I think in Japan, you learn that you have to read the air a lot. And it's kind of, it can be a little draining at times for some Westerners, to be honest, because, you know, people are used to just being more direct, I think, in the West. But I've gotten used to it. So now I'm probably like better at that in general, I would say. Amazing. Amazing. No, it, yeah. it, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much. This was a real treat for me and I know for all of our viewers as well. Um, so, yeah, we're so glad to have you with us. You reminded us just how alluring and beautiful Japan really is. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Well, I would um, like to wish you all a pleasant Monday evening and to John, a, a good Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us for Monday Night Travel Japan. Good night, Lisa. Good night, John. Good night, everybody. 